Church, I'm going to invite you to take your copy of God's Word this morning, this Valentine's morning, as we celebrate the not only earthly love that we have for family members, a spouse, but we celebrate the eternal love that we've received from a Father who has lavished His love upon us through His Son. Exodus chapter 4 is where we are this morning. Exodus chapter 4, specifically verses 1 through 23. If you're new to Dawson, we're walking through the book of Exodus together as a congregation. And we come now to Exodus 4, verses 1 through 23. I ask you, how do you get out of something that you don't particularly want to do? Well, what is your strategy in that moment? What is your strategy when, when you're asked to do something, you feel like you're getting roped into something, and, and there are times in your life where you, you need to do things that you don't particularly want to do? And there are other times in your life where you don't really feel that you have to do what you're being asked to do. And so it's in those moments, how, how do you get out of something that you don't want to do? You've got really, really big plans for Saturday, Friday at work, a co-worker who's sort of a nominal acquaintance comes to you and says, hey, I've got all the guys from work coming over to our house. We're going to have this huge breakfast spread. We would love for you to come. And you're really excited about that until there's a little bit of bait and switch. I got a U-Haul that I rented and we're all going to just kind of come over and we're just going to carry a few things from our house as I need to move my whole house. And it's in that moment that you're like a deer in the headlights. How do you, how do you get out of something that you don't want to do? Now, what if the person asking you to do something you don't want to do is God himself? What if you're being asked to do something by the creator of the universe himself, the, the one who has redeemed you through his son. But it's in that moment that you begin to fish for excuses. Well, if that's you this morning, and let me, in, uh, let, me let you in on a secret, that, that is you this morning. That is me. All of us know what it's like to, to fish for excuses when the God who has created us and redeemed us calls us. We're a whole lot like this reluctant messenger that we read about in Exodus chapter 4, the story of Moses who, who uh, receives this, this divine manifestation of God there on the mountain of God. The bush is, has, a, has a fire that is speaking to Moses saying, I am, I am. I am the God who is calling you to Egypt. And, and Moses' response to the revelation of God there on the mountain of God is, I am not. You might be the I am, but I'm not your messenger. Well, read with me in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 4. Moses answered God, but behold, they will not believe me. You're telling me to go back to Egypt? You're telling me to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go? Guess what? They're not going to believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. The recipients of this are not just the Egyptians, they're not just Pharaoh, but the very Hebrew people that he has been alienated from for over four decades. He is saying in this moment, they're not going to believe me. And God says, hey, take that staff, verse 2 of Exodus 4, throw it on the ground. He does that and begins to slither like a snake. They still won't believe you, Moses? Look at your skin, Moses, we read in Exodus 4. And, and he looks at his skin, Moses does, and it begins to have this leprous effect upon his skin. Moses, they still won't believe you, and he still he's not convinced. And then verses 9 through 10, we read the preview of coming attractions, how God is going to go before Moses into Egypt, and the very source of life and sustenance for the Egyptian people, the Nile River. A river that, that, that had a, a sense of deity in that Egyptian world. A, a river that, that they, they literally worshiped the gods of. He says, God, to Moses, I'm going to turn that river into blood. You still? You still don't believe that they're going to believe you? It's not just your word. I'm going with you and I'm going to give signs with you. And Moses, you know what he's doing? He's still fishing. 
Even after Exodus 1 through 10 here in, in chapter 4, he still, he still can't see over the dashboard of his excuses into the windshield of where God is calling him to travel and to go. He still can't do it. He's still fishing. He's still trying to reel in this big excuse to get God off of his back and for someone else to be the messenger. Verse 10, we read that Moses has got a, a transcript that he's sort of saying, hey, God, did, did you look? Did you do any research on me? It's about 10th grade. I took a public speaking class back in the palace, private school. And guess what? I failed it. So I, I'm, not, I'm not your guy. Now he didn't say that exactly, but you can read it here with me. Verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I am. Notice what Moses says. I'm slow of speech and of tongue. Now, don't miss what Moses does here. In verse 1 and verse 10, Moses has two comprehensive excuses to God. I mean, he has got an airtight alibi to be able to get out of what God is calling him to do. They will not believe me. And even if they would, I am not eloquent enough for them to understand the syllables and the words that come out of my mouth. So the deliverer, insufficient. The recipients, insufficient. And so what God says to both of Moses' comprehensive concerns here in verse 11 and verse 12, who has made man's mouth? Like Moses. Who, who, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Moses, I I'm in control to the receptivity of the hearers. I'm in control of the eloquence of the speaker. I'm in control of you as the deliverer, and I'm in control of them as the recipients. So get on, verse 12. Therefore, go. I will be with you and with your mouth, and I will teach you what you shall speak. This is a comfort. This is a comfort to all of us who ever open up God's word and, and speak the word of the Lord, whether you're, you're, you're a father or you're a mother opening up God's word and teaching the word of God to your children, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a life group teacher here that's ever stood before a, a, a class and opened up God's word and taught it, whether you're a faithful follower of Jesus who is just being a witness to a coworker, to a family member. It is a great reminder to us that we're called to be faithful, but it's only the Lord who can bring about understanding spiritually. It is only the Lord that can take the syllables that come out of our mouth and transform them into life change to the recipients that hear them. That your message and my message ultimately impels in comparison to the one who has called us as his messengers. And I'm always reminded of this as I stand before you Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, the absolute insufficiency of me as the messenger, but the glorious sufficiency of the one who has called me and has given the word of God for us to listen to. That this isn't just about listening to a message. It isn't just about reading words on a page. But the Spirit of God is with us and going before us and is doing something that is beyond our comprehension. Fred Rogers, that Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, is in Pittsburgh before Mr. Rogers' neighborhood kind of gets to public, you know, national, frankly, international renown. Many of you know he's a seminarian at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, so he's taking seminary classes, visiting different churches. He and a group of friends, they go to a noted church there in the Pittsburgh area. They sit through a message, and like a seminarian, they begin, Fred Rogers does, to be able to apply what he's learned in the classroom to the very sermon that he's listening to, and he begins to notice the theological miscues of the preacher and begins to just try, kind of write them down. Bad day for the preacher. Maybe he didn't get enough sleep the night before, but there were a lot of grammatical miscues, and he's just kind of writing them down. 20 minutes comes to 25 minutes, and he's just sort of, he, he is listening to this totally, totally unimpressed by the messenger. The sermon ends. Song of response is sung. They all stand. He has one of his 
his uh, fellow seminarians that had, had come to the church with him, and, and he, he turns to her with his list of things ready to really sort of uh, to, to say how, how disappointed he was in the sermon. And before he can get one word of critique out, he notices that she's weeping. Tears down her face. She looks up at Mr. Rogers and says, that's exactly what I needed to hear. That's exactly what I needed to hear. I've been a pastor for 18 years, opening up God's Word every Sunday. A little bit of experience with this. Some of you have been Sunday school teachers for 28 years, 38 years, 58 years. You've got some experience with this. Moms and dads, grandparents in here, opening up God's Word, teaching it to your children. You can relate to what I'm about to say here. There have been times, I, can, I have lost count how many times after a sermon, I go to the back of the sanctuary and somebody walks past me and says, you know something, Pastor, I needed to hear exactly what you said. And then they give me a sentence and I never said it in the sermon. Never said it. I mean, there, there are times where what a person heard me say it's just like almost a complete uh, 180 of what I actually said in that moment there. But God used it because God is working. And sometimes somebody needs to hear a word from the Lord that this preacher doesn't even say. But the Spirit of God is working. He's moving. And he's speaking. I'm reminded as Isaiah tells us when we open up God's word, it does not come back void. And heart change is never dependent upon the eloquence of Moses, nor any pastor, nor any Sunday school teacher, nor any father or mother who opens up the word. It's ultimately the word going forth through the power of the spirit, breaking the hearts of people. You've been there where the word of God has gotten to you, spoken to you, molded you, changed you. And it's not just about syllables, is it? Not about the rhythm or eloquence, but it's the anointing of God, the Spirit of God that is moving. And Moses, with all of his hesitations, they won't believe me. And I can't speak these words. God says, I am your sufficiency. I will give you the words. I'll speak through you and before you. Well, Moses... He's not caught a single excuse that's big enough to give him an alibi to the Lord here. And so you know what Moses does? He, he throws in the white towel. He just holds up at his hand, and now he's begging. Now he says, pretty please, God, anyone else, read it with me in verse 13. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Verse 14, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? Know that he can speak well. I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. This is what God is saying. Hey, Moses, if, if you're not going to do this, I'm going to speak to you. You're not, you're not getting out of this. I'm going to speak to you. And Aaron is going to be the spokesperson. You're going to be the mediator. Your very spokesperson, the PR director, is going to be your Hebrew brother here who's going to be the, uh, the, the spokesperson to the Lord. And then Moses, even here, is saying, oh, he's got an answer for every one of my excuses. Even when I throw in the towel, he brings my brother back to help me here. Now, I don't know about you, but it is easy for us to read this story as this sort of a Sunday school lesson. Keep it all back there in Midian and Egypt. Oh, look at Moses with all of his hesitations. I'm going to tell you, when you read the word of the Lord in Exodus chapter 4, there's a mirror there. And you know who you see in the mirror? You know who this preacher sees in the mirror? Me. Look again. Who did you see? Oh, you see Moses. But don't be misled. You're there. That the same excuses that I so readily have, they, they won't believe me. Who am I to bother them? 
The same excuse, I I don't know exactly the right words to say. You see, the excuses of Moses in verse 1 and verse 10, they're the same excuses that travel with us today in 2021 as God has called every one of us who are followers of Jesus to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. You don't have to pray about that. God has called you to do that. We pray to be found faithful, but this message, this, this calling is before us. On all of our lives, a calling to be his spokespersons, to be his witnesses. And we say, well, God, if, if you knew my coworker, if you knew the bitterness and the hardness, if you knew how, how she'd been burned by the church, you would know that you, you definitely are not calling me to, to bring about a gospel-centered conversation, to be faithful to her, because she, she's not going to listen. He's not going to listen. Oh God, if you, if you knew that uncle or that cousin or that family member, I know you're telling me to go and be faithful and, and to have a gospel-centered conversation with them, to be a witness, but God anybody else would be more qualified because that he's going to ask some questions. And what if I don't have the right answers? What if he asks a question and, and I don't have an airtight, theologically refined answer to be able in that moment for him to say, oh yes, I see. Well, certainly somebody else is better qualified. You see, we're just like Moses. You Me, we are. We're like Moses. He calls us to be his witnesses. And we say, I don't think that they're going to believe. And even if they would believe, I'm not the right person to do this. So call a pastor, call a Sunday school teacher, call a deacon, but don't call me. We are like Moses fishing for excuses. And God calls us to push through the excuses, to rest that our perfection is, isn't, and it never is a prerequisite for our calling to be messengers for him. If you're here and you say, hey, I can't, I cannot be a witness to my family members because they've seen me do some things. They've heard me say some things. They, they know my baggage. Guess what? Join the club. Moses, the murderer who flees to Midian, He's been there and done that. If you say, hey, I don't have all the right answers here. Join the club. Neither did Moses. And I think we need to be reminded here that our hesitations in being a witness for the Lord are always overcome, not by us and our sufficiency, but us resting in his sufficiency, leaning into the one who has called us and the reminder that God is already at work in the lives of all of those that are around us. Do you hear me when I say that? That any place that God calls you to go, your neighborhood, your school, your workplace, guess what? He's already at work in the lives of those that are around you. So you're not having to introduce them to the God of creation as much as to see that the God of creation is already there, already moving. Now, they might be ignoring his work, denying his work. The work of the Lord might be dormant in their life, but he's there. Sometimes we over-exaggerate the hesitations. Satan does this. He mutes our witness because so often, especially in a place like Alabama and South, we, we have this, uh, this, this politeness and we, we sometimes never want to go to a place where we might think someone is uncomfortable. But I'm always reminded that most people are actually encouraged when you have the courage to be able to bring up something of what the Lord is doing in your life. In a land, land, uh, a land far, far away, in a time, time, long time ago, in, in, the, in the place of Mississippi where I was pastoring, I had uh, someone that lived on our street that we got to know really, really well. And my neighbor came to me and Danielle, and they said, hey, we're taking our family and our children, and we got to know them really well. And so God is calling us. They didn't say, God, work is calling us to go do something else. And we said, oh, we're sorry to hear that. And so they had their 
their uh, for sale sign in their yard, and we sort of would talk to them after uh, being years of, of their neighbors. And then finally the day came where the U-Haul truck was there, and they were loading it up, and off they were going to their next place. And I remember, because we had had conversations, me and, and my neighbor, we had conversations about everything. And when I say everything, I'm talking about the things that are really, really important. Mississippi State football, and we were talking about things that, you know, kids and sports and all of those kinds of things. We talked about where they went to church, talked about my role as a pastor. We talked about all of those things. And I remember Danielle and I walked over for the last time to be able to say our goodbyes. We were talking about how much they enjoyed that house and why they're excited about going to the next place. And then he said, David, before, before I go, I, I've got, I, I just, we never got around to this. But, but I wanted you to know that when I was a teenager, I was really rebellious to the Lord. And, and God used a friend in my life to be a witness to me and I became a Christian there, and my life has never been the same again. And, and I just felt like I needed to tell you that. And it was such an encouraging conversation. We talked for, for many more minutes there about what God had done in his life and how he'd seen the sufficiency of God through Christ in his life. And it was such a deeply co- encouraging conversation, but it was an immensely convicting conversation for me. Because hours upon hours upon hours upon hours upon hours of conversation that I had, and we talked about everything under the sun. The weather's good today. The weather's not good today. Boy, if we wait till next day, the weather's going to be different. We talked about all of those kinds of things, but we never got around. That was his words. We just never got around to the thing that matters the most. And it was almost like he was saying, well, preacher, if you're not going to bring this up, let me witness to you. And I don't know what it is. I still have this hesitancy, and you do too. Satan wants to mute our witness. And he wants to bring up every excuse of why you should never take a conversation to the things of the Lord, but understand that God is already at work. And what we're doing is being his witnesses. We are one beggar telling another beggar where we found bread. We're one sinner telling another sinner the sufficiency of Christ in my life, in your life. We're his witnesses. And Satan wants us to be mute. He wants to silence us. Why? Because this is his plan to bring people from darkness to light. Your conversations through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, just think about this for a second. Why are you a Christian? What's the work of the Holy Spirit? But someone, a father, a mother, a coach, a teacher, a Sunday school teacher, a youth minister, someone pushed through the hesitations to share with you what God had done in their life and how that could be true for your life. We are all recipients of the work of the Spirit moving people through their hesitations into a confidence that God is already at work. Well, Moses has no more excuses. Off he goes. Well, he goes not to Pharaoh immediately. There's going to be a showdown, but in verse 18, the showdown is between Moses and his father-in-law. Read with me. It's kind of a surprising synopsis of what he's experienced. He goes back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and he said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. What? <laughs> like if we're reading scripture here, we're kind of thinking, no, uh, am I missing something? Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Moses says nothing about Pharaoh. He says nothing about the burning bush. He says nothing about let my people go. He says nothing about any of those things. Now we could imagine, the Bible doesn't tell us everything that happened. It tells us everything we need to know. So we can imagine here, this is, the, this is the cliff notes of their conversation. Or because we know Moses, we can imagine that Moses is still hesitant Telling people what God has told him. And so what we discover is Jethro says, go in peace. Verse 20, Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hands. It's a little detail here, but notice in verse 1, it was Moses' staff. When he throws it down and it becomes a serpent, he takes it back up. That is the staff of God. 
It is a reminder, Moses, you're not going in your strength. I'm going before you. I'm going to give you the words and the confidence. It doesn't rest in you. The staff of God is me with you. And that's going to come back to us in this story in the chapters to come. So Moses sets back to Egypt, loads up the minivan. They're pulling out of the driveway of Midian. He's got his sons with him. He's got his wife with him here. They're headed back on the freeway to Egypt. And God says, oh, yeah, by the way, let me tell you a little bit of the fine print. Notice what he says in verse 21. When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. You remember the leprosy turning the Nile into blood, the staff into a snake? But, that's quite the conjunction, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill, God says, through Moses. These are the words that will go to Pharaoh. I will kill your firstborn son. Moses is headed back to Egypt. And he receives from God a preview, a coming attractions, the the rest, the judgment of God that we're going to read about, the plagues, all of it is previewed in here. The way that God is going to ultimately set his people free is previewed in here. We want to say, now what, what in the world about this? I will harden his heart. What are we talking about here? Now, I know I'm tempted, we're all tempted to go off on this sort of excursus here to be able to figure out theologically what is going on in this passage. But guess what? We're going to do that. We're not going to do it today because in chapter 7, in chapter 8, in chapter 9, in chapter 10, in chapter 11, Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We're not going to understand the narrative without understanding what's going on there. So can we put it to the side? And focus on one last thing that God says to Moses. It's the first time in all of the Bible that we have this phrase that Israel, verse 22, is my firstborn son. Verse 23, let my son go. If I refuse, I will kill your firstborn son. You see how God is saying to Moses that the people, the Israelites, the Hebrew people that have been in bondage, they are my children. He's, that's my son, Israel. And so if, if Pharaoh will not let them go, then there's going to be a judgment that comes upon them. Now, this is not the last time in the Old Testament we're going to have this theme of the Israelite people being God's son. You see it on the screen, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I told you this is a preview of coming attractions. It's not just a preview of coming attractions in the book of Exodus, but it is a preview of coming attractions in the life of every Christian. Because as children of God, we are only children of the Most High God through the adoption that is offered to us by faith in the finished work of his firstborn son. Notice with me in 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called, and notice the theme, children of God. And so we are beloved. We are God's children. God is placing before us. He is placing before us a pattern A pattern that salvation is only accomplished through the death of a firstborn son. That the the salvation of the Israelites will only be accomplished. And and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, it will only be his tears that weep over the death of his own son. God is telling Moses before Moses is pulled out of the driveway of Midian, headed back to Egypt, this is going to be the path of salvation. And not only is it a preview of coming attractions for the Israelites' salvation, but it is a preview of coming attractions for us in the New Testament, for us as believers, because your salvation, your deliverance, not from Pharaoh, but from Satan himself, not Egypt, but your flesh, your sins, it is only accomplished through the death of a firstborn son, and it's not Pharaoh's son, but it is God's eternally beloved son, his one and only. 
only begotten son. So the picture of salvation is right here in Exodus chapter 4. That we are God's children through faith in the death of the eternal firstborn son. And that through the death of God's only begotten son, we by faith experience freedom. Freedom that only Christ can grant as he has defeated death. He has defeated sin. And so the death of the firstborn would bring salvation then. And it brings salvation now. This was Moses' message, Christians. And it's our message as Christians. That salvation is only accomplished through the central news, the glorious gospel good news of the death of God's eternal son. So God was with Moses in the midst of all of his hesitations. And guess what? He's with you in the midst of all of your hesitations. So he says, go and be my witnesses. And we're out there fishing for excuses. But there's no excuse that you can reel in that's bigger than the sufficiency of God's call on your life. He is in you, with you, and he goes before us. This is glorious good news. Let us pray. So it is, God, that we come to you this morning. We know what it's like to be hesitant. We know what it's like to to have the call of God upon our lives to be salt and light in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our families. We know what it's like to, to, to retreat to silence the hiding our light under a bushel. But we're the light of the world intended to reflect the very light of God that has shined in our hearts as we've received by faith freedom, deliverance. And we have the great joy to be able to share what someone has shared with us. We have received from darkness light. And you've used family members in our lives, friends in our lives, pastors and teachers in our lives to to be messengers. Imperfect, yes, we all are, but messengers we're called to be, to share the, the good news of your love for all sinners. I pray that there's not a person here today that doesn't know that truth personally, the truth of God's love for them through his son. I pray for all of us that are here that are followers of you who feel the hesitancy of Moses. In the midst of our hesitancy, in the midst of our excuses, may we relish the fact that you are with us and you are larger than all of our hesitancies, all of our imperfections, all of our baggage. And you call us to be your witnesses. What a privilege that this doesn't rest solely on our shoulders but it rests on your eternally strong shoulders. Thank you, God, that you find us faithful. Amen.